make sure that you subscribe or die to this channel. And also, let's hope the WWE makes sure that they don't get the idea in their head that it's a good idea to do too many pay-per-views that are this damn long. In particular, when they're not very good. And you knew, starting with the kickoff show, that we were in for a squirrely, kind of screwed up night. They're interviewing Baron Corbin, and he botches one of his lines. There's mic problems. There's all of this crap. And then, as you can clearly see, the arena is basically empty because somebody came up with a wise-ass idea at the Barclays Center to say, oh my God, their pre-show is starting at 5 o'clock, knowing that they have three announced matches for the pre-show before we even get to the main card that starts at 7 Let's not start letting people into the building until after 5 o'clock. And then the WWE and Vince McMahon and all their dipshit logic and infinite stupidity decided we're going to trot out a couple of these matches before we have any fans in the damn arena. Like, how ridiculous is it that the Miz and the fucking Hardys, combined with Jason Jordan, who is the illegitimate bastard child of the raw general manager can't even main event the pre-show they're curtain jerking the pre-show and you're having this match unnecessarily when there is nobody in the freaking arena look mistakes happen screw-ups happen don't have these matches when there's nobody fucking there imagine somebody and i know there have to be some people that one of the acts, if you will, that they paid money to see at SummerSlam, buying a ticket, waiting outside, was the Hardys. So imagine how pissed you would be as a fan, knowing that by the time you got into this stupid arena, to your God-blessed seat, you missed one of the damn reasons you came to the show to begin with. No excuse for this. Completely and totally unacceptable. What the hell was Vince McMahon and what the hell was the rest of the WWE support staff around him thinking? You shake up the format of the damn show, you deal with it, you push all three matches to the second hour of the pre-show if you need to. This is freaking ridiculous. How embarrassing for these guys and a nice way to make these guys feel like shit. There was a big part of me that once Miz pinned Jason Jordan, I was really hoping that when he was signaling, he wasn't signaling for his belt, he was signaling for a mic so that way he can talk about how he's the mid-card MVP of WWE and how this is complete and total horseshit because it was. And then... Soon after, instead of changing things up and making sure you get more fans into the arena so it doesn't look like a GFW freaking house show, we decide we're going to have the Cruiserweight Championship because Wool's got to fucking rush in. You sent out another match with nobody in the damn arena. Well, slightly more than nobody compared to the opening tag match. It looked terrible. The optics of this were absolutely horrendous. And it's really hard as a viewer to get as involved in the match when it feels like it's not a big deal because, again, nobody is fucking there. And this match didn't even come close to measuring up to the match that Tazawa and Neville had on Raw. And frankly, while these guys tried to be professional and put their best foot forward in front of no fucking body, ultimately, it's got to be really hard to step up to a high standard and perform at a high level when, again, nobody is fucking watching. And of course we just put the strap right back on Neville. This is some Russo shit all the fucking way. Stupid, stupid, stupid. At least one positive is Elias got to finish a damn song. In fact, he got to finish two damn songs. Now he actually had some people in the arena and he stole the damn pre-show for me. He was magnificent. See, this is what happens when you allow Elias to finish his song. And then, of course, you close out the pre-show with the SmackDown Tag Team Championship match, which had a really slow start, eventually got good, to eventually being really damn good, just so that way we once again do another title change because we apparently want to hot potato all of the freaking belts as much as we possibly can, save one or two here. And fuck this match being on the pre-show. These guys were the one good act at Battleground, talking about the New Day and the Usos. And what better way to incentivize their great performance at the shitty pay-per-view that just came last month, where they were the one real headline saving grace of the show, to say, you know what, up yours, we're going to put you on the pre-show. 
and still in front of an arena that's not entirely filled up. Just dumb on so many different levels. Almost as dumb, almost as dumb as Colonel Heartbreak Kid. You brought in Shawn Michaels to dress up like Colonel Sanders for a KFC spot. That pretty much perfectly encapsulates the pre-show. And it should have been a premonition for how the rest of the night was going to be. Because let's be honest, a lot of us heading into this show were probably saying there was one real match that had our interest and that was the main event for the Universal title. And boy, did it deliver. And a lot of you surely were looking for Nakamura to win the WWE Championship at a Big Four (laughs) pay-per-view. Well... (laughs) <laughs> that didn't happen, but let's talk about the main card. I can't believe John Cena opened a big four pay-per-view. Breakfast Club shit. Big four pay-per-view. Curtain jerker. This was clearly an example of John Cena had better shit to do at this time, and he didn't want to be bothered with Baron Corbin, just like WWE didn't want to be bothered with Baron Corbin anymore, apparently. How ridiculous to sit there and have him win Money in the Bank just to throw it away, just to sit there and basically have John Cena troll everything about this. From the very beginning when he goes out to the commentary table and he puts on JBL's hat to just the way he worked this match and the way it finished and even afterwards he kind of gave that look once he had pinned Baron Corbin 1, 2, 3 of like, eh, I know this sucked and I know that my payoff's going to suck, but I got to go do the Today Show. Corbin crapped the bed. And my one disappointment about all of this, and shame on me and shame on all of us, we did not get hashtag Baron Corbin is buried party trending. Some of the other things you've seen, this guy is over party, that guy is over party. We should have had hashtag Baron Corbin is buried party because he got buried, straight buried, just like his hair follicles on the top of his head. I'm just saying Oh, this is a bad match, though. So. You could tell Cena didn't really, really want to be bothered with it, and he made relatively quick work of Baron Corbin. Uh, the SmackDown Women's Championship match was really my surprise of the night, though. I was surprised with the pacing of the match and how good it was, how much these two ladies, Naomi and Natalia, did during the match. I was pleasantly surprised we didn't get the cash in from Carmella. And Natalia ultimately got her moment and what really sunk sunk it in for me and really, really brought it home for me was after she lost the title, Naomi's sitting there fucking crying buckets of tears. I mean, that's how you get people engaged. That's how you get people to suspend disbelief. That's how you get people interested. This SmackDown Women's Championship match to me was outstanding. And not just outstanding for a women's match. It was just a really good match, period. And clearly to me, one of the highlights of the night, which is not something I can say about the Shark Cage match. Big Slow versus Big Ass. Did we have a whole lot of hope for this one? Probably not. Could this one have been on the pre-show? Probably. And you started all off with an Enzo promo. And him being from the armpit of the country, New Jersey, all the people in Brooklyn see right through his certified bullshit. He cuts his long-ass promo trying to get like 300 versions of cheap pops and gets none of them. The promo is terrible. The reaction is terrible. And it's very appropriate for the terrible match that we were going to get. And this match went on and on and on and on. And I know it didn't feel like maybe it was that long, but it kind of didn't. At one point in time, Enzo's doing all that jumping in the shark cage, even though it was kind of low compared to usual. I'm sitting there thinking to myself, you know, <laughs> be a hell of a time for an Owen Hart swerve. I'm just saying, maybe too soon. Maybe too soon, but it was 18 years ago. I'm just saying. Uh, but the whole shit about seeing Enzo strip and oiling himself up, he apparently got into Randy Orton's stash and... He's sliding out through the cage and jumping down just so that way he could immediately get the big boot from Cass. Like, that is literally Vince and Kevin Dunn trolling this motherfucker. You do all of this shit just to get out and immediately get kicked. It had no impact on the match whatsoever. Big ass won, and this match was a big bowl of ass. Period. Speaking of big bowls of ass, at this point in time, I'm like, I'll hurry up and run the doggies out really quickly. Let them go potty. We'll come back. And thank God it was really quickly because I got in just in time to see the entirety of Rusev and Randy Orton. And it wasn't much of an entirety. 
And apparently there's some reports that Rusev has asked for his release. I don't know, and I don't care. But the simple fact that this match was as short as it was, and once the bell rung, it was an RKO out of nowhere. One, two, three. Hashtag breakfast club rules, bitches. This was magnificent. All we needed out of this show, frankly, even though you could talk about the Raw Tag Team Championship and what transpired there, but they still, Sheamus still had the Raw Tag Team titles heading into the show. All we needed was an appearance by God, because we got Shawn Michaels, maybe Batista, I get you. But this was still a banner night for the Breakfast Club. John Cena buried Baron Corbin in spectacular and efficient fashion. And Randy Orton said, oh no, <laughs> I can top this with my sleeve tattoos, my construction worker beard, my baby oil, my raging ring boner. Rusev's about to want to go AWOL from the WWE. Boom! One, two, three, RKO out of nowhere, bitches. <laughs> Hashtag LOL Cena wins. <laughs> Hashtag LOL Orton wins. And the funny thing is is this probably was Orton's best pay-per-view match of 2017. Just let that sink in for a second. Hashtag Breakfast Club Rules, bitches. It's magnificent. No matter how much shit changes, it still stays the same. Baryon fools a decade and a half later. Magnificent. Mwah! And then think about that. Randy Orton won his first World Heavyweight Championship 13 years ago at SummerSlam 2004 against an invisible opponent. What a career for the legend killer. One of the founding members of the Breakfast Club. Uh, the Raw Women's Championship. I thought it sucked. And part of it, granted, was because you're originally building towards Bailey and Alexa Bliss. And I get that. That you have to change your plans at the 11th hour. Funny that the Brooklyn crowd was booing the piss out of Bailey. <laughs> See how long they're going to fight against the grain here and not go with just turning her heel. But... I thought this match was kind of bad. It was sloppy. You could feel elements of these two really didn't like each other. But again, there's just no story there for me. These ladies have wrestled multiple times before. And ultimately, you put the belt back on Sasha Banks for the fourth time, which I had no interest in seeing. I just didn't see where Sasha Banks winning the title made a whole lot of sense here. And it was just... It's a bad fucking finish, too, to make it so bad. It's just like you do all this stuff, and then all of a sudden it's just like, oh, we put her in the bank statement. But did, 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 did. What the fuck is this shit? Who puts these matches together? It's just unbelievable. Unbelievable. It was bad. I don't care what anybody says. And I frankly thought Alexa should have retained. And it was a whole theme of this night is all of the title changes earlier on. You, you were wondering what that was setting up for later on in the night. But I think we had, what, a total of five title changes in a row? That's just crazy. That was an awful lot of them. A lot of hot potatoing of the belts back and forth, which I'm not down for. Uh, during the SummerSlam preview, I had mentioned that Finn Balor versus Bray Wyatt should just be the entrances and that's it. But if WWE is going to insist on actually having them wrestle, give it to me sometime between 8.30 and 9.30 Eastern time so that way I can... Take a leak, have a smoke, take the dogs out for another piss break, and WWE obliged. The dudes obliged, and I appreciate that very much. In terms of the entrances, clearly Finn would have won this, but then, unfortunately, eventually the match starts, and I came in for the second half of the match. Don't tell me that I missed a whole lot. Don't tell me I missed much for the first half of the match, because these two guys weren't going to do anything special, I promise you, and I'm sure they didn't, especially based off of what I saw in the second half of the match. It's really stupid to have a dude dress up in this demon paint and not do anything different. There is nothing different about the dude. I'm sorry. And they're just, frankly, for Finn Balor, isn't a whole lot there. Finny the Twink fucking sucks. And I'm tired of people bashing on certain guys, but allowing guys like Finn Balor, who have no personality, no real charisma whatsoever, no ability to talk on the microphone, get a pass. You know, if he was in a tag team with, like, Neville or something, that's fine. If he was in the cruiserweight division, great. He would be an asset to them there. But putting him here... You know, at least I'll say this, is we're progressing in the right path. 2016, he's wrestling for a title at SummerSlam. 2017, he's in the mid-card in a meaningless feud against a meaningless opponent in Bray Wyatt. 2018, to the pre-show we go, yes! We figure it out. Just understand, Finn Balor sucks. 
And either you know it now or you're going to know it down the road. Give me a break. I mean, then we get to the wrong tag match on the main card. And I know people are going to like um, Rollins and Ambrose versus Sheamus and Cesaro. I will say this. I popped massively when Cesaro went out there and got the beach ball. The people that bring the beach balls to freaking Raw or SmackDown or the pay-per-views are fucking tools. If you want to go play with a beach ball, go to the fucking beach, you morons. So that was legitimately cool. And honestly, this match is probably a little bit better, quite a bit better than I'm going to give it credit for. It's just, it didn't measure up to the SmackDown Tag Team Championship match by any stretch of the imagination. And I just don't care about the premise of the story about, oh my god, the Cockfist crew, two-thirds of them are back together. Who gives a shit? The crowd's hot for it, so they can have their moment. It just wasn't for me. Then the United States title match, also known as the Shane O'Mac show. And you know how this was going to go. You know how this was going to go. It's got a McMahon in it, so it's ultimately going to gravitate towards being all about the McMahons. And this is the guy here that has fallen off of scaffolding, survived helicopter crashes, and the ridiculousness with which the ease of him being taken out multiple times happened here was just ludicrous to me. It was preposterous. Like you're doing this in part to build up to a match between him and Kevin Owens and you're making Shane McMahon look like a punk ass and we know he's not a punk ass because of some of the shit he does with his body. I will say I thought the match was pretty good even though you always had the distraction of Shane McMahon and this and that. Kevin Owens was magnificent especially when he's talking about Are you kidding me? You fall off of buildings and you can't <laughs> that's when Kevin Owens is at his best is when he can come up with shit like that that was that was awesome that was awesome it's not like Baron Corbin and other people talking to a crowd that was completely silent telling them to shut up um, although going back I thought it was <laughs> Nat and the referee had a great exchange <laughs> but again the U.S. title match was exactly what it was. It's just a plot device here where AJ leaves with the title and we launch off into Owens and Shane O'Mac, probably at Hell in a Cell. It was all about the McBands. What else did you expect? It was interesting that they had the two world title matches back-to-back, -back, starting with the WWE title. Um, it's great that they brought in the dude um, to play the violin for Shinsuke's entrance. That's cool. Because... That, that feels nice at the bigger shows to do something like that. It elevates a guy's profile in my mind a little bit to me. To me. It gives them a little bit of a, more of a star aura about them. But then once the match started, uh, the match was bad. The finish was terrible. Um, Jinder having to tell Nakamura to give him the arm. This was just bad. With that said, I don't know that the booking decision was wrong. In the days leading up to this event, I kept thinking more and more, especially with having the Singh brothers involved, that it might be right to not have Nakamura win the title here. And that might be an unpopular opinion, but as is always the case, I don't give a shit. And part of the reason I think this was the right decision is when you look at Nakamura, to me he's the type of guy that if you're going to have him win a world championship, it should be a bigger deal. I felt like when it comes to this match at this time, it was the wrong opponent. It was the wrong time. It was the wrong match. It was the wrong story. Everything about it was just wrong. So whereas if Nakamura wins the title, you can sit there and have people be happy. It's not going to resonate the same. It's not going to connect the same. It's not necessarily going to be any indication of him having a successful WWE championship ring if you did it here. It doesn't mean you can't do it in the future against gender. It doesn't mean that you can't push it back a little bit and give it to Nakamura down the road. Maybe one year you have him win the Rumble or whatever the case might be. You know, there might be bigger fish to fry. But right now, I got to say this, and even though you could blame WWE and, and that's valid, is Nakamura hasn't been the best once he got up to the main roster. It's felt like he's kind of been kind of complacent, a little bit lazy. His matches have been less than stellar. So based off of his main roster WWE work, he does not deserve to be the top guy on SmackDown. Period. If you don't like it, eat shit, bitches, because you know it's true. We're not going off of name reputation of New Japan. I'm, I'm just saying. So, it was a bad match with a terrible finish. The booking decision, I don't have as much of a problem with. 
because I get it and I understand it and I don't disagree with the premise of the timing, the moment, the opportunity, the opponent was not right. Because it's not like Nakamura is so uniquely white hot that you had to strike while the iron was hot. He's warm, but I wouldn't say his character is hot right now. I would rather strike when Nakamura's character is hot, really hot. And it just isn't right now. So accept it. And we'll see what happens down the road. Well, ultimately, we had to go through five and a half hours of mostly bullshit to get to the one match that most of us probably really truly cared about. That was the Universal Title Fatal 4-Way. And this match was everything I could have hoped for and so much more. It truly lived up to the billing of what I thought it was going to be. This was a main event with four freaking monsters. This was brutal. This was physical. This was crash test dummy bullshit. We're not bothering with rest holds and chin locks and all this other garbage. It is boom, 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 go, go, go. High impact, high impact, high impact. And that's exactly what it needed to be. And as you go through, you could hear the respect for Joe from the crowd, the intensity of the white hotness of Braun Strowman and makes you wonder maybe if they actually should have struck while the iron was hot. You could hear the intense white hot hatred for Roman Reigns. Ooh. Because again, trying to hijack shit and trying to boo him when the WWE is trying to present him in a way where you're supposed to like him, even though they really don't based off a lot of the crap that he does, is going to change anything, right? Give me a fucking break. The WWE did this shit for over a decade with Cena and you knuckleheads still haven't learned. Hijacking isn't going to change a thing because if anything, the WWE has now shifted their logic, getting out of the heel and face mindset and saying they're gauging everything based off of reaction. And if you react with the, you boo or cheer... That just makes the guy controversial in their own bullshit spin fashion. The more you react, the more they're going to push him because they live for the reaction. Vince McMahon, Kevin Dunn, Hunter, all the powers that be in WWE are reaction marks. The bigger reaction you get, the less likely they're going to be to move off of a guy. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. But the stuff they did with Braun putting... Lesnar through two tables and then throwing the third table on him. They wheel out Lesnar on a freaking uh, backboard and stretcher only for him to come back out down the ramp later on in the match. There were just so many things about this that were awesome. And I'm sure for a lot of you, even though there's probably some disappointment, and frankly for me there's a little bit too in terms of having Lesnar just retain the title after all of that shit, especially knowing you're going into NFL season, especially knowing that he hasn't been a great part-time champion, especially knowing that You have guys like Joe and especially Strowman where you could legitimately put the belt on him and pain event. was it just was not enough to save this show the show was way too goddamn long had too many matches where you didn't care about the characters or the personalities of the stories several of the matches were just frankly flat out bad like that wwe title match between mahal and nakamura is one of the crappier ones i remember seeing in quite some time quite some time And based off of how crappy that match is, I think it is yet another reason why freaking Nakamura shouldn't have won the belt. Is that how you want to culminate him winning his first world title in WWE was with this flaming turd? I mean, there's just stupid crap all over the place. You take your Money in the Bank winner on SmackDown and within a week, you have him (laughs) not be able to successfully cash in and getting buried by Sita in the opening match of the card. You got a shark cage match where the freaking Chester Cheetah looking dude oils himself up, slides through the bars, jumps down to get swift kicked in the face, and it had no impact on the finish whatsoever. Rusev and Orton with everything lasted less than a minute. Sasha Banks is freaking champion again. Finn Balor and Bray Wyatt had a match, even though there was absolutely no call for those shenanigans, no need to whatsoever. It was just a bad night. And when you get tired, like I started getting tired because the show was too fucking long, 
it just kind of makes you even a little more negative than maybe you need to be. But the, that's the WWE's fault. And I feel bad for the people that were there that had trouble getting in when they were supposed to because the WWE was too stupid to adjust their plans to where, make sure that you didn't miss anything important. And the Barclays Center was too stupid to open it up at an early enough time to ensure the fans got in to be able to enjoy the whole show. If this is your WrestleMania of the summer, God only knows what that means for WrestleMania next year because this company on so many different levels botched this show badly and should be ashamed of themselves. But I'm sure they'll be circle jerking themselves in the back tonight talking about how great and awesome this was. It wasn't. It fucking sucked. You had Shawn Michaels, the last image of the pre-show. On the pre-show, you brought in Shawn Michaels dressed up as Colonel Sanders. Colonel Heartbreak Kid. That tells you all you need to know about SummerSlam 2017.